Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. It's so good to see you here this day. This is a day that we have been praying for and looking forward to. This is the start of a lecture series that uh, I have felt like was so needed and so pertinent in our day, not only in the life of our campus, but in the life of our culture. So we're excited today to welcome Dr. Tate Cockrell with us from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He'll be here delivering not only the, the sermon today in our chapel, but five sessions of a lecture series dealing with the, the harmful attributes of pornography. So immediately following lunch, we will resume and we will begin uh, again here in the chapel with a one o'clock session, have a two o'clock session, then come back tomorrow at nine as well. Um, for those of you that are watching this live, uh, it'll be on uh, Facebook, I think, later. We're having some internet issues. We will be live streamed, but Facebook not at the moment, just to make you aware of that. So, Dr. Cockrell, thank you for being here with us. I know we have a few other visitors. I see Brother Dennis Wilder with us, the Director of Missions from Cumberland Gap Baptist Association. We're glad to have him. And Miss Penny Fox, we're so glad to have you with us this day. Uh, look out there and see her beautiful face, so we're thankful for that. Uh, today, Dr. or Professor rather, Wilson uh, is having some health issues, so he will not be with us. I think we're going to have an augmented uh, band or, or uh, praise team today that will be leading us, so be in prayer for them. Brother Taylor is going to come, lead us in prayer, uh, then they'll lead us in worship, and Dr. Cockrell, you come. Good morning. Um, Cayman has asked that we pray for a friend of his, Ashlyn, in Fort Wayne. She has had 32 seizures in 24 hours, and the doctors don't know what's going on. So be praying about that. It's probably stressful for uh, her family as well. And just be in prayer for our lecture series today. Pray for a brother who's going to come and preach for us. I know it's a touchy subject, but I know it's one that we all need to be aware of be know, and know how to fight against it. So let's all go to prayer. Father, we simply want to come before you and just thank you for who you are and all that you've done for us and all you're continuing to do for us. Father, we praise you for the wondrous work of the cross in which your son died for our sins, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Father, we praise you for that wondrous act. And Father, today as we go into this time of worship and preaching, I pray that our hearts are oriented not on ourselves, but they're oriented to you and your word. Father, break down the, the walls that we have on our hearts against such topics that we're going over today, Father. I pray that you will work mightily in us today and work mightily through your speaker. And I pray that we do all things with the glory of your name. It's in your precious son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll begin our worship with, uh, with Jesus paid it all.
y'all have a seat. We have one more song, uh, but y'all may not know this one. We haven't played it in a little while, so. Uh, but those of you who do know this, y'all just y'all sing along, and if you are able to pick it up, you sing along too. together for another chapel service, but uh, Lord, as we uh, prepare ourselves to hear this message and uh, 
just in general for these uh, this lecture series. I pray that you would just uh, begin to open our hearts to receive your word um, and your truth, and I, I just pray that you would move among us and, and draw us closer to you, um, and Lord, uh, educate us about uh, this serious issue that uh, is dominating in the church. Uh, it's such a, a widespread issue, and I just pray that you would um, prepare our hearts, work in us to make us pure and holy instruments and also prepare us to be able to minister um, in, in situations where this is uh, an issue. Um, Lord, we just pray your blessing on this chapel service, on the, the preaching of your word now, and we just pray your blessing on this, this whole lecture series, and we just pray that you would uh, move powerfully we look forward to seeing you move powerfully. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. You know, usually whenever I go speak, I do that. I have to do that twice. Usually I say good morning, like two people say good morning, and I got to say good morning, and you say it again. I'm not accustomed to people just like automatically speaking back. That's pretty awesome. I think I'd like to take you guys with me every time I go speak somewhere. That'd be pretty nice. Take your Bibles this morning, if you will. Turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. While you're turning there, uh, let me just say thank you for uh, having me today and uh, tomorrow. Beautiful campus here. Um, really looking forward to being able to share a few lectures with you about the topic of, of pornography. Um, I, I have to confess to you that Doing these lectures is hard for me, uh, and it's hard because I know what is at stake. Because I'm the guy that when your life is a mess because your husband or wife has left you, or you've been forced terminated from your ministry due to moral failure for looking at pornography, I'm the guy that gets called, and I'm the guy that gets to do counseling with you. So literally over the last 20 years, over 25,000 hours of counseling that I've had the joy of doing, a large portion of that has been with men and women of God who have experienced devastating destruction as a result of pornography. And so every time I prepare these lectures, it is new and fresh for me. Uh, every time I prepare these lectures, I see the faces of the individuals that I've counseled over the last 20 years. And I see the potential lost and the ministries lost and the lives that have been impacted. So I really do hope that over today and tomorrow that you really will listen with a heart for understanding and that you will not chalk this up as just another lecture series that has really good information, but that ultimately it will be transformative. Because here's what I know. I don't want this to be true, but I know it to be true. There are people in this room right now who are looking at pornography. You're, this, this room is not immune to the national statistics related to Christians and people in ministry. 60% of pastors have looked at pornography in the last 30 days. 60% of pastors have looked at pornography in the last 30 days. 78.8% of Christian men report that they view pornography regularly. That's almost 8 out of 10 men. Evangelical Christian men. 8 out of 10 of them view pornography regularly. So there are people in this room, I guarantee you, there are people in this room who right now, maybe even in the last 24 hours, you've looked at pornography. 
I don't want you hearing me say that to be oppressive. I don't want you to feel shame as a result of that. I would beg of you and plead of you, get help. And get it now before it's too late. Because we all say, everybody I've ever treated, they all say tomorrow is going to be the day they start. Tomorrow is going to be the day that they get help. And I don't want that to be you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Here's what God's Word says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God as you are doing, do this even more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this matter because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses. As we also previously told and warned you, for God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. From 2000 until 2005, I had the joy and privilege of serving on faculty at New Orleans Seminary in New Orleans, Louisiana as a professor of counseling. And uh, my next door neighbor was a great guy. He was a fellow colleague, fellow faculty member. Taught at, he ta I taught on the graduate side. He taught on the undergraduate side. And uh, we became great friends. And uh, he was a master mechanic. He could fix anything. Uh, had just a super heart of servanthood. Uh, when my wife was pregnant with, uh, with our twin boys, uh, and I was uh, teaching and kind of traveling the country, speaking and, and uh, doing recruiting for the seminary, he would just come over and mow my grass without me even asking. Like, I would come home, my grass would be mowed. He was just a great guy. Just a, he was just a great guy. We, we grew to love him and his family and, and uh, was really sad. You know, one of the reasons I was sad whenever the Lord took us away from New Orleans was that, that I was no longer going to have a relationship with this, with this guy and, and his family. August 24th, 2015, he went home to his home on the campus of New Orleans Seminary and took his life. And he did that because in 2015, you may remember that there was a hack of the Ashley Madison website and there were names that were disclosed that showed up on this pornographic uh, extramarital affair website and his name appeared on the site. He had had an active struggle with pornography for decades that went untreated and unknown about. He lived in secrecy. It came out. Six days later, he took his life. I don't know right now, honestly, I don't know that there's a greater scourge upon the church than pornography. Pr just prior to coming to Southeastern Seminary where I currently teach, I was the pastor of member care at the church at Brook Hills in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, Brook Hills sends literally hundreds of people onto the mission field. Uh, you may know David Platt, the pastor who is there, who's now the president of the IMB, he just has a real heart for, for missions. And so we were routinely just sending dozens and dozens of people every year. They literally have hundreds of people on the field all over the world. The interesting thing is, is that the ratio of men to women that they send on the field is about 10 to 1. Not 10 men for every one woman. 10 women for every one man. And the more we got to looking at those numbers and why that was the case, the more we began discovering that men weren't even applying to go onto the mission field through our church because they couldn't get past one little question on their application. Have you looked at pornography in the, in the last 12 months? And they saw that question, knew that they couldn't 
answer no to that question, knew that they had not been pure from pornography for a year, and so they just don't even pursue going to the mission field. So it's having a profound impact on our ability to be able to mobilize men and women for the cause of Christ. And it will have a profound impact not only on your life, but it will have a profound impact upon your ministry. This morning from our text, I want to share with you three very short truths, very simple truths. They're not groundbreaking. It's probably nothing you've ever heard before. But I think three simple truths that we see from our text that speak specifically to the idea of purity over pornography. Now, before we jump into that, before we actually jump into the text, I want to ask you to reflect on one simple question before we get there. And that question is this. What is your worldview? What is your worldview? Do you have a secular worldview? Do you have a biblical worldview? Do you have a gospel worldview? Do you have a self-centered worldview? What is your worldview? I think today, more than ever, I see a group of Christians and a group of ministers who claim one worldview while living another. They claim to have one mentality while they live out another mentality in their life. Really quickly, before we jump into our text, I want to just set the groundwork for kind of everything that we'll talk about today and tomorrow. Because how you determine what your worldview is will speak greatly to every single lecture that we have over the next two days. There's three questions you need to ask yourself to determine what sets your worldview. Three simple questions. One, who is your authority? Two, where do you obtain knowledge? And three, who do you trust? If you answer those three questions, you can determine how you're actually living out your worldview. Not what you think you believe, but what are you actually believing? On the side of authority, we would simply ask the question, who has the right to tell me what to do? And how do I evaluate what I do? Who am I concerned with pleasing and who do I answer to? Who is the authority in my life? That's the first question related to worldview. Second, knowledge. Who knows what's best for me? Who knows what's going to be best for me, both short-term and long-term? Who has answers to my questions, and what are those answers? And how reliable are the answers that I'm trusting in? And then thirdly, trustworthiness. Who do I trust? Who loves me and wants what is best for me? How much confidence do I have in the person or the thing that I'm trusting in. We are living in an age where the answers to these questions aren't nearly as clear as they used to be. You need only look around to determine that. We live in a progressive secular age where postmodern, post Christian relativism, radical individualism, and the sexual revolution have really muddied the waters for many people in our world, including, by the way, the Christian community, not just people out there, but people inside the church. We have entire denominations today that are changing hundreds, if not a thousand years of church history and saying that they have a Christian worldview. Can I just give you a very practical example of that from pop culture? On January 7th, Oprah was awarded the Cecil B. DeMille Award for Lifetime Achievement at the Golden Globes. She gave this great acceptance speech that was lauded by secular culture. She, I mean, Oprah needs to run for president. That's how good the speech was. And there was no doubt there were aspects of the, of the speech that were quite, there, it was quite well done, especially when she specifically talked about the abuses of power of men abusing their positions of authority to take advantage of young women. And there was one part for me that particularly stuck out because of my interest in culture and worldview, particularly as it relates to marriage and the family and pornography and purity and those issues that I am most passionate about. She said, What I know for sure 
is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we have. What I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. Not speaking the truth, speaking your truth. Now, there's a problem with that in that there is no such thing as your truth. There's the truth and then your opinion of the truth or your response to the truth. But there's not your truth. There's a basic set of facts and a basic understanding. There is what is. Specifically, most absolutely, there is what is contained in God's Word that is what I tell my counseling students at Southeastern Seminary. There is what we call big T truth and little t truth. And God's Word contains big T truth. It's what I can depend on all the time regardless of circumstances. And yet, our culture says truth is arbitrary. It's a moving target. It's what you define it to be. There there is an entire population of Christians today who believe viewing pornography is not only okay, it's actually helpful for your marriage. That is a little t, arbitrary, moving target of my definition of what is true. So in this ever-changing, moving target of subjective truth, we have to make sure that where we go for our source of authority is not the culture, it's not media, it's not what's popular. You know, ever since the sex- sexual revolution, what we've seen inside the church is individuals whose sexual ethic has ever been changing, and it all revolves around what the culture says. The problem is the culture is broken and fallen. And yet, here's what we hear. Whether it's same-sex attraction, transgenderism, pornography, any one of the, the plagues of the sexual revolution, what we hear is, oh, well, those of you who are conservative that believe that those issues are wrong, you're just on the wrong side of history. And you know what? In some respects, they're probably right because there probably is going to be a day. There already is a day, for instance, in the issue of homosexuality where in our day and age today, it's acceptable. And we are, as believers, we are countercultural to say that homosexuality is a sin. And indeed, there are people who are Christians in entire denominations that would say that if you believe that it's a sin, then you're on the wrong side of history. Well, in my opinion, and this is just a brief little aside, I would rather be on the right side of God and the wrong side of history than the right side of history and the wrong side of God. Because God's word doesn't change and culture changes all the time. Culture changes all the time. And so this age of pornography, this pervasiveness of pornography today is a reflection of a broken, fallen culture. And so is my authority going to be God, or is my authority going to be the media, or is it going to be culture, or even worse yet, is the authority going to be myself? I consider myself to be a relatively spiritual dude. I, I've been a Christian for a number of years. I've, I've read the Bible through multiple times. I, I, I am, I'm a devoted husband. I'm a devoted father. I read the scriptures every single day. I try to do everything that I can to follow Christ as best I know how, according to the word. But the scripture says that my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And that is the reason why I need an authority outside of myself. And so from from an authority perspective, I have to make sure that God, and most specifically the God of the Bible and not the God of my creation, is my authority. See, there's a... I heard it said one time, and I thought it's absolutely true for our culture today, that God made man in his image, and then we returned the favor. And now we have created a God that is inconsistent with the God of the Scriptures. And so what, we, what you will hear in culture is, well, I believe 
I feel, I think. My dear friends, can I just encourage you today to say as we look to God's word, the language we ought to be using as God's children and as ministers of the gospel ought to be God said. Not I think, I feel, I believe, or it might be with certainty. Here's what God's word says, that's our authority. Secondly, what's our source of knowledge? Who are we going to believe? You see, because all around us, what we hear day in and day out is, oh, the, the science has proven this, and the science has proven that, and you know, this study shows this. And, and listen, I'm not anti-science. I'm real, I am not anti-science. I have a PhD in counseling psychology. I've studied more science than you care to even think about. But if I could just use this kind of humorous slash serious analogy to show you how shifting science is when our source of knowledge is secular science versus God's word, you have to remember that the same scientists who are telling us that homosexuality is okay and the same scientists who tell us that transgenderism is okay and the same scientists that say that pornography is not, is not harmful, those same scientists are the same scientists in the same types of studies that one day they tell you that eggs are good for you. And the next day they tell you that eggs are bad for you. And then the next day they tell you that the whites are good for you, but the yellows are bad for you. And in every single one, and now it's a humorous example, but the reality is I want you to really think about when those studies come out, what they say is we have proven, science has proven, studies have shown. My PhD minor is in Foundations of Education. And as such, I teach advanced level statistics for our seminary. And I'm just smart enough to know and have done enough teaching of research and reading enough research that I know I can basically make the numbers say whatever I want the numbers to say. And so if I have an agenda, if I ask the questions a certain way, I can come up with the right answer. What's our source of knowledge going to be? And then lastly, who do you trust? When you think about our worldview, when we go to the scriptures, who are we going to trust? Are we going to trust a world that's broken and fallen and most definitely has an agenda? And that agenda is not thinking about what's best for you. That agenda is not thinking about your eternal soul. More oftentimes than not, that agenda is driven by one of a couple of things. And more oftentimes than not in Western culture, it's driven more by money than it is anything else. What can we sell? Or it's driven by fame, popularity, or it's driven by some form of dysfunction. Who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust the world that's broken and fallen, or am I going to trust a God who loved me so much that he stepped out of eternity, the creator of all things, who gave up everything, to purchase my salvation, a broken, fallen, rotten sinner. While I was still in my sin, the gospel tells me. While I was still in my sin, God loved me. Who am I going to trust, the world? Or am I going to trust that God? Well, my money's on that God. My money's on the God who loved me so much that he gave his dear son to die for me. So we go to... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Three simple points this morning. I can address them very quickly. The call to purity, the commands of purity, the consequences of purity. First, the call to purity. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 gives us a very specific call to purity. There are multiple spots throughout these first eight verses where we see this idea that God is calling us to a pure life specifically in the area of our, sexual, of our sexual lives. Additionally then, brothers, Paul says, additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, how are we going to live and please God, Paul says, and that you do this even more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is God's will. Your sanctification. Now, here's what's interesting about this text. 
Here's God's will for your life, your sanctification, colon, that you keep away from sexual immorality. Now, he could have listed 45 behaviors there, and in this instance, the Apostle Paul says that you keep away from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now, here's the thing. He says a couple of things here in this, in this call to period. He says, one, it gives, God, it gives God pleasure when you do that. That whenever God sees that we walk in holiness and we walk in honor, that, that he says, the Apostle Paul says, you know how to live and please God with your purity. It's very reminiscent of Jesus' Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Or it's very reminiscent of Psalm 24, one of my favorite psalms where the psalmist writes, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. There is God's pleasure found in purity. And then there's God's purpose found in purity. In verse 3, he says, For this is God's will for you. It's God's purpose that we live in sexual purity. But then there's the commands of purity. And there's kind of two separate aspects of these commands of purity. The Apostle Paul says, listen, I want you to live kind of two ways. One, in holiness. And two, I want you to live honorably. Live in holiness and live in honor. That's our instruction, right? So what exactly does that mean? Well, earlier in 1 Thessalonians, if you flip over just a few pages in 1 Thessalonians, you see a few verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul talks about what it was like when he was there in Thessalonica living among the Thessalonican Christians. He says, We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you had become dear for us. Dear to us, for you remember our labor and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preached God's gospel to you. The Apostle Paul is basically giving them an example of his lifestyle. And he's saying, listen, you have to live holy, separate lives. And you've seen that in the way we lived amongst you. If you've never had time, read, I believe it's Acts 17. So read 1 Thessalonians and Acts 17 side by side. And just watch the amazing story of what God did among the Thessalonican Christians. It's an incredible story to to, to read about how in just a few short weeks, God burst this church in, in Thessalonica. And it's because of this passion that the Apostle Paul has for these people. We have this desire to rebel against the commands of God because we're broken, fallen people. And Paul is pushing against that with the Thessalonican Christians. And he's saying you have to live in holiness. You have to live in separateness. That's what holiness means. To be set apart. To be otherworldly. See, one of the things that we get so dulled into forgetting is the fact that we are aliens and strangers in this land. This is not our home. And so if everybody around us is watching porn and saying it's great and it's okay and it's wonderful, that's okay. That's not good for us. That's not good for our culture. It's not good for our nation. It's not good for our churches. But at some point, we have to be able to stop and say, I don't live in this world, and even if everybody else around me does this, that is not the calling on my life. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. 1 Corinthians 6.18 Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Titus 2.12 Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. We are called to live that way in holiness today, not tomorrow, not once we get to heaven. We're called to live in holiness. Second, we're called to live honorably. What does that word honorably mean? Highly respected, highly 
esteemed. Hebrews 13, 4 says it this way, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Philippians 4, 8 commands us, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things that are honorable, that are pure, that can be esteemed. One of the things I try to ask myself about the things I listen to, the things I watch, the things I look out, look at, the way I look at things, I think if that were projected up on a wall for all of the world to see, would I be honored and respected for that? Is the person that I am in private, if that were projected up on a wall for all to see, would people find that honorable? Would they esteem that? Third, the consequences of purity. And I'm not going to go into this in detail because we've got other lectures and I'm going to address this, but there are positives and negative consequences to, pur- to purity. Pos- positive consequences if you espouse purity and follow it. Negative consequences if you live an impure life. Here are some of the positive things that happen when we espouse purity and, and live that way. One, the Scripture says we'll see God if we live pure. Matthew 5, 8, very clearly, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We'll be a friend of God, God's Word tells us. Proverbs twenty two eleven: He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. We'll be blessed, Scripture tells us in Psalm 119, 1. If we have a pure heart, blessed are those whose way is blameless who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek them with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in His ways. And will be used in ministry, 2 Timothy tells us, if we walk in purity. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. But what happens when we don't? And, and this, is the, this is the pain of my profession. One, we don't live in, in purity. We damage our own body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And if you are here for our lecture this afternoon, one of the things I'm going to talk about is physically what happens to your brain when you watch porn. And the reality is, it's devastating. It's absolutely, you literally, literally get brain damage from long-term exposure to pornography. You damage your own body with every single viewing of pornographic images, pornographic videos. Scripture says that Another negative impact is is that we won't inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5, 5, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Or Galatians 5, 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Scripture tells us that another negative impact is that we become a slave to sin. John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. One click, one look, turns into two, turns into three, turns into four. And if I had a dollar for every person who had sat on my couch in my office and said, Tate, I have no idea how I got here. Men who in their right mind would never dream in a million years of ever looking at child pornography finally find themselves on the wrong side of the law and in prison Because the insatiable appetite of lust pushed for more and more 
and more and more and more, and they became a slave. I tell my clients all the time, pornography takes you further than you wanted to go, keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and costs you more than you ever want to pay. Last negative impact, you have the potential to lose your ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul gives us this warning. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners compete? But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Well, I do not run aimlessly, Paul says. I do not box as one beating the air, but I pummel my body and subdue it, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. And every day there are guys being forced terminated from their ministries and losing them because of pornography. So how do we respond today? One, choose to live in glad submission to Christ, adopting a worldview that is grounded in the gospel. We have to begin there. Choose to live in glad submission to Christ. At the end of the day, and you will hear this throughout all of the lectures that, that you hear from me over the next two days, pornography is a worship issue. Pornography is an idolatry issue. It is I am placing my own wants and my own needs and my own desires and my own pleasures above my glad submission to the Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. So we need to choose to live in glad submission to Christ. Second, heed the call to live in purity in thought, in attitude, and in action. We'll talk about how to do that as we go through the next five lectures together. And then thirdly, recognize both the glorious consequences of a life lived in purity and the grave consequences of failing to live a life of purity. Every time I go on the road, and I am on the road a lot, one of the first things that I do, and I did it last night, I, I got in late last night, rolled in about 11.15, one of the first things that I do is I pull my computer out, and I turn it on, and there's a picture of me and my wife and my kids on the desktop background of my picture, uh, on the, on the, uh, a picture on the desktop background of my computer. I pull it out, and I sit it over on the nightstand, and I remember that those three people that I love and that I care for, that they're watching me. And I'm in that room over there by myself, and nobody else is there, and nobody knows what I'm thinking, and nobody knows what I'm doing except for me and God, and it's not just my life that's at stake. It's those, it's those other three people, my wife and my twin boys who are still at home, and my daughter who's no longer at home. We have a responsibility to do the things that are ultimately going to remind us of the benefits of purity, but then also protect us from the ravages of the negatives of not living a pure life. I really hope that you will come back this afternoon. We're going to talk about the myths of porn. We're going to talk about your brain on porn and what happens. And that will be fascinating to you if you've never heard that. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about how do you break free from the destructions of porn. You know, if you're, if you're dabbling in it a little bit, or maybe you've already, you're already caught in its grip, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about protecting your digital world. How do, you, how do you go about protecting your devices and your computer and those sorts of things? And then we're going to talk about how do you love someone maybe who is struggling with the use of porn. Some of you may be married to someone who's struggling. What's your role as a spouse in that? What do you need to know about you and what do you need to know about them? Okay? Let me pray for you. God, thank you for giving us some time together this morning. God, I pray that as a result of our time together in the Word this morning that you would call us to a life of purity. God, that you would call us to a life that we won't settle for second, second best intimacy. But God, you, we, we know that you want us to be in an intimate relationship with you and in a right, healthy, intimate relationship with those significant others in our life. So God, help us not settle for Satan's second best. 
God, I pray for that man or that woman who is in this room today and Satan has them in his grip. God, I pray that they would experience grace from you. That they would break free of the shame that has kept them in bondage. And God, before it's too late, they would reach out for help. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.